Thank you all for being here. It's great to talk to you, great to be around other racketers. I work in an industry that has very few programmers, much less people who are working on this. So it's, it's good to be around some of my own kind this morning. So I wanted to talk to you about, uh, I gave a film in my title as Racket in the Film Industry, but I'm going to do something a bit broader this morning, and I want to describe the big data, big media racket. Also known as how to not use racket in the industry, or how not to get a day job using racket. And there are a couple key ideas I want to talk to you here. I want to give you guys an idea of what it is that I do, and what, talk a bit about big data, since I talk about big data a lot. Talk about what it is we do at NBC Universal, we're a big media company, and finally tie that all in on how we're using racket in our day-to-day -day operations. Now this big data word is a fun one. I don't know if you guys follow startups or technology, I assume a lot of you do, but you would know that there's a lot of buzzwords that goes through the industry. I think about 10, 15 years ago, the big buzzword was Web 2.0. Anyone here remember when that was all the rage? Yeah, so I know after that, what did it come? Social? Social was all the rage for a while. I know venture capitalists in the Valley were eager to fund any startup that was doing social. Then we moved on to the really exciting one, the cloud. <laughs> and finally, this one's, this one's starting out now, but it has been pretty big. It was, it's the big data slash data science one. And this one has been really great. This one's been going mainstream. We, we even have a, a Dilbert comic on this one. The Harvard Business Review published, I think, in 2009. That this job, big data, data science, my title, is the sexiest job of the 21st century. I love that. <laughs> Harvard Business Review, in case you want to read it. Now, each of these we have a lot of hype going through, and beyond the hype, there's a little bit of truth. I mean, Web 2.0 was, was, it was hyped up, but it was kind of cool to make Ajax requests, right? The whole XML or Remote Procedural Call request, that was me. Social, it's, it's kind of good to talk to people. Cloud, <laughs> long way out of proportion, I, I will, but you have to give them some credit. It's really neat plugging in the computer to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, this big data one is a bit of a misnomer. There's some ideas here, and it's been taking over. The craze has been pretty insane. Um, one of my colleagues who's a consultant in London, he gets paid a couple, his company gets paid a couple million pounds a year to go to other companies and set up these Hadoop clusters. Do you all know what Hadoop is? No. Okay, they set up these Hadoop clusters inside these companies and advises them on how to launch their big data strategy. And what he sees is after a couple months when they've been working with them and they've launched their big data strategy that they have maybe two megabytes a month going through the Hadoop cluster. <laughs> PDFs going, and they, they're making a couple million million pounds on it. Good money writing these high ways that you can do it. But the underlying search behind this, the little poor bit of usefulness that's, that should have been obvious in hindsight, is this is driving a trend across industry to move to quantitative methods to make business decisions. Instead of flying by the seat of your pants, running on your gut, there are a lot of people, especially some of the newer companies out of the valley, but even Older industries like us are now trying to find things that we can measure, things that we can see change over time, and try to get these different teams talking to each other and sharing their information and using that to make business decisions. That's what this big data thing is really all about, moving to quantitative metrics, and that's part of what I do. On the big media, I work for NBC Universal International means if you watched NBC and you saw that wonderful skit on Saturday Night Live was Aaron Paul pretending to be uh, the guy from Breaking Bad talking to President Obama, I have absolutely nothing to do with that, unfortunately. <laughs> um, the international business is a parent company that oversees several smaller companies that are related to what we do in the U.S., but not quite. By the way, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I very much prefer to have questions and people interacting with me. I don't like to hear the sound of my own voice, and I'm sure you guys would like to chime in as well. So please feel free. So what are companies?
company looks like, because we are several smaller companies. The one I'm most familiar with, the one I started with, is Universal Pictures International. And this company doesn't make films, but it distributes, markets, and sells films to the individual cinemas in over 50 different countries. <coughs> Next to this, we have TV production. International TV production, and just to be a, 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 a good corporate fanboy, we have one of the most successful international TV production studios. We're one of the only ones that sells our content back to the US, which is pretty remarkable. In any case, these guys make television shows, and then they go and sell them to different channels and distributors all over to carry them, again, across 50 different countries. A related business, but still a separate business, is television distribution. And this is all of the channels that we own. And here what we're selling is not content per se, it's actually advertising space. Next, we have another related but separate business, and this is news. CNBC and NBC News. Which is pretty similar to TV distribution. We're mostly selling ad space here. We have parks. And for the international business, Parks really looks like a travel agency, which is less exciting, but still a part of my day job, so we're going to talk about it. Then we have a business called New Media, which is responsible for making sure that your con the content that I hope you would like to watch shows up on Netflix or on Amazon or wherever else you want to watch it. And then our favorite one, our favorite one, not yours, is home entertainment, which is responsible for DVD sales. <laughs> I did the same thing with her company. <laughs> Apparently, lots of people still buy it. This is actually the most profitable business in all of these. Profit's going down, but it's got a, a lot of gas in the tank. So this is NBC Universal International. And the what you see here is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different business units. Each business unit has their own head, their own HR department, etc. But it's a little bit worse than this. But inside of here, we have sales and sales. We have distribution, and we've got marketing. These are all separate teams, separate divisions with their own heads, etc. And this is repeated in production and distribution and distribution, and news, and parts, and new media. None of these people actually talk to each other. So when we're trying to do big data, which is quantitative business analysis, the easiest thing to do, the value can generate, is trying to get some bridges between these different units here. So each of those distances has three different boxes like that. Three, four, five, two. So each business is a little bit different, but this is typically how it works. Sales, distribution, marketing. Sometimes it sells research and marketing, different teams together data. Now, this big big data craze is inspiring both NBC Universal and other businesses to move to quantitative metrics. The problem is in sales and distribution and marketing, there is not a lot of quantitative talent. And in the higher up picture, senior management, there's not a lot of quantitative talent either. There's plenty of facts, but not be too much. So you're going when you're trying to work in these businesses, anything you do here, you have to take care of all the complicated metrics yourself. If you're going to do something as simple as linear regression, you should keep that to yourself and just show them the results. If you're doing something more fancy, like nearest neighbor's regression, are you going to find your metric for nearest neighbors? That's a, that's a non-trivial problem that we spend a lot on. That's not something you're going to be able to discuss with senior management or some people on the ground. You have a, a lot to a lot of reinterpretation to do on each step to get things going. But when you're actually delivering a solution, you have to make sure the solution is something they can understand. You can't just write a MATLAB script and give it to them and expect Billy, who has a film degree, to understand how to use MATLAB to get the results. So when, you're, when we're developing something, we need to offer something that can do the analysis, something that gives a good UI, and something that's intuitive for people. 
Now, that's the first two, but I'm trying to quickly. The last bit on how we start. Yes, sir. When we say a uh, solution, are you talking about something that people inside of the sales distribution marketing are going to use themselves? Or are you crunching the data yourself and then presenting the results? It's a tool that crunches the data for them and shows it back. So it's something they can give data to and then get answers out of them. Okay, can you give an example of one of the questions that they would be asking? Yes, I can give lots of examples and I will do that next. All right. I'm going to give an example for each business unit as I tell you guys how I got involved and how I started using Rapid. Anything else? I will confess something. I actually forgot my slides this morning, so I'm kind of worried I'm going to forget a quarter or a third of my talk. So questions are really great because they help me stop for time in case I forget something important. <laughs> <laughs> right. I first started in UPI about three years ago. I was, I was contacted by the head of a guy in distribution slash research on a Monte Carlo simulation that they were trying to build. He was one of the more intrepid people in the industry who wanted to jump on board this quantitative trend. Um, originally, this was a tool just him and I were using that was designed wholly in Racket. Recall it. I'm not going to get to the internal link, but... So, the question we wanted to answer for this tool was to figure out 69 months in advance what the gross box office is going to be in a particular country on a particular weekend. I'm sorry, did you say 69? 629. Oh, 69, 69 months is kind of a weird number. So, you pick that country for a particular one? Weekend. Weekend. Weekends are the uh, theatrical one, when people go to the movies. Fair enough. Oh, thank you. Uh, was he already racketeer? No. So, this point here is a very good way to uh, talk about how, to, how you can become a racketeer in this group, or how you can become a bird laker in this group, or a house blower in this group. It turns out, especially in an industry like this that doesn't have do a lot of software in-house, nobody really cares what you're using. They care about the data you're getting from them. If you give them a tool that's telling them what their gross revenue is going to be six to nine months in advance, you can program it in brain bucks. They're going to look for it. <laughs> <laughs> The key thing here is not to tell them you built like brain bucks before they are getting the results. This is a mistake I made. <laughs> so I built them, um, we talked about a Monte Carlo solution that he was trying to do in Python. And I was a racketeer before I joined this company. I saw the, his little Python script, which is a, looks a bit like the MATLAB scripts you might see in undergraduate, right? No offense to, to my boss. I'm sure you guys are, are familiar with the, the kind of code you see. It's kind of half-baked, runs sometimes, lots of more comments than there is code because they're not really sure what they're doing to describe it to themselves. So, so I, we, this, this program was able to generate a uh, box office weekend based on Monte Carlo methods one week in advance, assuming you manually created a lot of data for it. And the first tool I built for them entirely in bracket was a tool that could create a PDF that would show them on any given weekend or even a range of weekends, you, you can tell it what you want what the box office is going to be in that country. This tool I built completely in Racket. I still have the source code. The problem was I started mentioning this Racket language around the senior management and the people who know a little bit enough about programming to be dangerous. And they're here in Racket and like, to that Python was a pretty risky thing. They didn't want any Python. No snakes going on in the company. Snakes on the plane was a terrible movie. If they do not have to do it. <laughs> Racket has kind of bad, it's like the comedy scheme, like the stock market specific in Europe. <laughs> that should be an attraction. <laughs> <laughs> there was a marketing ploy. We're, we're not in plan. We don't do oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we did it in Racket. It was it was working great. Um, for political reasons I had to rewrite it in Python where and still is. Um, after this, I learned if I'm going to do Racket, I should keep it very quiet and not tell people about it too much. Py even Python was pretty risky. Every time we, I mentioned we're going to do something in Python, the answer is like, what I got back from my senior management is, Python going to be around. 
Are they going to still be doing that next year? <laughs> what, if it, what if it breaks on us? So what are they going to do? They're going to have to acquire Python to keep this working. <laughs> um, similar question came up with Racket. Because that one, Racket isn't even, doesn't even show up in Harvard Business Review or, or in Forbes or wherever it is they heard about Python. <laughs> <laughs> So, unfortunately, this had to be rewritten in, in Python. <coughs> but it was still a successful project under this big data side where it was getting our distribution and our research teams together with our sales teams and telling them what they, giving them some very useful business information that they can use. This tool later on developed from a PDF report to an iPad app. And this is where using Racket started to become difficult. Um, as you may have recall, I think it was in uh, January 2012 or 2011, um, NBC Universal and several other companies sponsored a piece of very unpopular legislation of the Stop Online Privacy Act, which angered a hacker group, which DD last us every week for several weeks after that. Um, our IT department is great sometimes. And uh, even our internal stuff was affected. So I was, when I'm doing something like an iPad app, this is going, actually being a uh, JavaScript application, it's really just a, a web app that happens to work and look nice on an iPad. Um, Racket has a very great web server built in, and these are the kind of technologies that we're interested in. I, I know there's many smart people working very hard on stuff like contracts and typed Racket and lazy Racket. I don't use any of that in my day job, right? but stuff like the web server we're very interested in using. But because we've never tested, the web server is kind of untested and kind of hard to decouple from Racket itself. We can't integrate it with a, a more traditional web server like the Canvas Python or its PHP, God forbid. And we were, I was personally reluctant to use that and have, have our, this whole system break down by a DD Racket. So once this started moving to, to iPad apps, we stopped using Racket, kind of fell by the wayside, and Python was taken over. So I'll say. Google was doing for Python. I'm sorry? How did Google was for Python? Extremely easy. In fact, Racket is still my first two choice for developing any prototypes. 90% um, of the time, the code that we write in Racket is just basic function definitions written in a functional way. Right structure interpretation of computer programs. That's pretty much my manner for doing things. That translates almost directly to Python. It was very little One thing I should say about Racket that I really like, the, I was talking to another gentleman about this. Python, the reference implementation is an interpreter, C Python. And this could be either my not knowing Racket very well, my not knowing Python very well, but code that I write in Racket translates into Python usually runs about twice the speed, or half as, twice as slow as the, the speed in Racket. Racket is twice as fast. Racket is twice as fast. Um, this has improved a lot if I'm using PyPy implementation, which is pretty comparable to Racket. And both Racket and PyPy are using a just in time compiler, which I'm pretty sure is responsible for the speed up. But this is one of the, the telling points I use to convince us to use Racket more. Before I go on, I should mention why we actually use Racket. I've touched on this already. We don't need contracts. We're not defining new languages for every business unit, so that feature is not useful for us. The primary motivation for using Racket is just because we like it. I, I, I like it, and I, I think that's a more sufficient reason to use the tool that I'm going to be spending my time with eight hours a day. It's the best reason. Exactly. <laughs> if you want to write your code in, in, in BrainFuck or LOL code or Whitespace, you can do it in Racket. I'm sorry? <laughs> 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 I was wondering if you ever pitched to management the efficiency of um, the development. No. No? Uh, those arguments kind of fall on deaf ears, really. They, uh, this is a good segue into the other stuff I should talk about this project, actually. So one of the, as I mentioned before, one of the key points is that whatever we do, when the end user sees it, when the research team or the sales team or the senior management sees it, 
It's got to be very simple and explained exactly in the context of the business. We can't even use terms like standard deviation. That was a film. And it's, it, it just doesn't <laughs> The other thing that we need is things have to be very, very fast. Um, a lot of the value you get from big data, big data, so to speak, is from having software that you can you can implement quickly and gives you results quickly. Monte Carlo simulations, embarrassing problem for me. I, it seems a very simple solution to get the results fast. I have a hard time delivering it as quickly as I want. Now, when senior management is asking for something, if they come in and, uh, and say, we need a report on what's going to happen in this market on this weekend, we're not a company like uh, that consistently does software development. We're not like Amex or, or Google, who have a standard practice. This is kind of guerrilla warfare in this company. We're hiding under our desk. We, we have to hide our computers and our Amazon clusters from IT. And we're not doing any IT here. Don't look here. <laughs> but see, when senior management comes and asks for us, they're not thinking about the labor that goes into the question. They ask, they say, they ask you for a report that takes you five weeks to do. That's you. But anything you can do to speed up that work looks good on you because you do it. So I wouldn't say racket is speeds up development a lot. That's kind of my secret weapon. So I can get work done quickly and I, I don't want them to know too much about it. Yes, sir. <laughs> what do they think you're doing for? <laughs>
they can do it, they can do them fast. And then you have your more expressive languages. And he puts R and MATLAB over here. Um. <laughs> now in this particular project, we're only I'm using about 8, 12 megabytes of data. Uh, another project I want to get on our marketing for here, 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 and here, where our data size are a couple of gigabytes. In R, one of the problems that you have is once you start loading in memory that takes up some, a significant portion of RAM, R becomes very, very slow. Other problem with R, and this is not something I experienced myself, I don't write a lot of it, but something a member of my team for this year, I feel, he, he's actually written R for us, is uh, R is not a fun language to write. <laughs> he's R4S. He's R4S. No, I can say R. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, R. R is not very fun to write in. Racket is a lot of fun. R is a bit like writing a PHP. The, uh, the, your function names are kind of out there. Your semantics are a little bit weird. Well, you know, the computer vision community has been moving steadily as far as they can tell away from that, that where it's quite not precise to you guys. There's, there's some sweet spot in the middle over there where, like, just like writing some Python said, where you get, it's, it's exactly that power versus expressive. That's exactly what my colleague does. He puts he uses closer and puts it in here. I am allergic to the JVM. <laughs> <laughs> I put rack in here. But Python by itself is an okay tool. Um, you usually need to use it with something like NumPy. And IPython notebook is the if you're not using a, a REPL, IPython notebook is probably the next best thing. Yes, sir. For R2, there is a slime uh, interface where you can use it together to give an interactively program in R. I, I would know nothing about it. <coughs> I'll take a look on it and thanks for the tip. Let's move on. So this project with UPI, it's been successful. It's uh, nowadays, because of Monte Carlo simulation, it actually runs in the cloud. <laughs> we, we have several servers running on, on, uh, on Amazon that sit there and wait for requests. And the controller, the actual simulation is written in, in Python, but the controller for the simulation that tells which of the client nodes to start is, uh, is actually still in bracket. Um, I wrote the initial one, my colleague Phil rewrote it and made it much better because I'm not a very good programmer. <laughs> and that's, that's the state of this project. I'd say it's about 10% Racket, 30% Python, and the point that I keep mentioning is things have to be very simple and very intuitive. I mean, you're doing a lot of stuff in the web browser, so you're just doing a lot of GUI work. So the remaining 90%, and I know these don't add up, but this is where all the bugs are in, then JavaScript. Somebody can write a typed JavaScript. I would love yes. to Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> JavaScript is uh, JavaScript and UI because it's the biggest portion of bugs and development costs we have. Now, very related to TV production distribution news and UPI marketing, which is still not talking to the rest of the company, are projects to uh, gauge the level of audience interest in a particular product, and this is closer to big data, because we, we will get very large reports coming from third-party research groups. But more importantly, we're also collecting information from Twitter, we're collecting people's YouTube comments, we're collecting snapshots from IMDb. This is very messy data and very hard to parse. There's also a lot of it. So this is, this is the more traditional stuff where you, you have to open it and look at a website and extract data from it. To do this, we're using a lot of Bash scripts. We're using some Racket, and it's still very much a work in progress. We don't have a, a robust solution coming out of it. And one of the bigger portions of this is not, or the underlying portion, the part that we want to hide from senior management, is the data collection and analyzing that data. And that's what they test out with some Racket, some Bash, a lot of these sorts of things going on that's our operating <coughs> cluster, our map reuse. <coughs> but the other side of it, when we're trying to present key results, is again going into JavaScript. And we use a lot of 
a library called uh, history.js. <coughs> now, there is a tool for Racket that we've been experimenting with called Wilson. Have you guys all seen it? Wilson is a pretty nifty. Did this writer of Wilson here? Well, Song is a pretty cool tool for compiling to JavaScript. Um, there is a benefit of being able to write raw JavaScript in your browser and writing it there. So it's going to be reluctant to use a lot of, to add, extend our JavaScript tool chain. There's also ClojureScript and uh, CoffeeScript and lots of other JavaScript languages. I much prefer Racket. And this is something we're looking at, especially as our, our JavaScript library gets bigger and more messy. Parts. Question. You would like the type system for JavaScript, but you don't use type writing. <laughs> Indeed. It, and that, it's perfectly rational. I'm just curious why. Uh, is it because you have more UI problems? And more UI. The so larger problem is I don't run into weird casting issues in Rocket. Right. And the silent failure problem with JavaScript. It's a silent failure problem with JavaScript. Um, in Rocket, usually if you're if it's expecting a number and you pass it a string, yeah, Rocket just turn it into a Rocket. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the contracts in Rocket are RTI. In JavaScript, if you're expecting a number and you give it a string, it might return. Undefined usually, but that's yeah, all the numbers, so it's okay. Undefined. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of if you've ever been on Stack Overflow, there's a lot of fun. It's like a little bit of a leading question, but do you have trouble structuring data in JavaScript more than you do in Racket? What do you mean by structuring data? So in Racket, a lot of times you just do define struct all over the place yeah. and you need to be packaging things up, and that gives you all sorts of almost type-like failures in runtime if you use the wrong thing. Um, and in JavaScript, even if you try to build class hierarchies or whatever weird thing you're trying to build, Sometimes I have that problem that I feel like my data is less structured in JavaScript. I'm wondering if that's a complaint you have compared to Racket or not. A little bit. Um, a lot. One of the things I really like about Racket and any list is that code is data. And I tend to use uh, transparent structures to hide my data inside of readable Racket. And then using not quite eval, but you guys are familiar with constraints when you're trying to read raw data from code and inject it into it. You could do that to load data, keep it in a nice clean place in Racket in the bottom. And this is a feature I find very useful when I'm doing my racket programming. Saving all the data, the data that's coming out of the Monte Carlo simulation, but also saving data and then taking a snapshot for it, for my version of continuation. In JavaScript, I can't really use all of this, but Java, there's been a lot of smart Java developers working with JavaScript developers working over the years who have seen these problems. They've developed something called JSON entry using it. Um, it's dirty, but when we're in JavaScript, we mostly put everything in JSON. This does lead to some of those bugs I was talking about. Is there another question? Do you use define struct when you program in writing? Yes. You do? Okay. So it would be like we're programming everything in S expressions without any structs that we can Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is the this this part where we're looking at marketing and function and trying to use it to get a value for our products is where our big data lies. These are ongoing projects that haven't fully developed and offered a mature solution, but they're they're getting there. And in each they very each business unit are quite similar, but they're a little bit different. For instance, in marketing, what we're really trying to do is get this to feed data into our simulation. We know how much our marketing spend is affecting the box office gross, but also how people, when we get a measure from other sources, from our research groups, from IMDB, from Twitter, etc., we can get a, an idea of how the audience is responding to market materials and how that affects how they go to the cinema. And that actual analysis for this, thus far that I've done, has all been done Racket, because this is experimental code. This is a place where Racket really shines, this is an experimental programming especially if I can translate it easy, just easily into something else if I need to. <coughs> TV production and TV distribution. Um, TV production is quite similar. We're trying to find the value of a 
piece of television is produced. TV distribution is a little bit different and a little bit more complicated. Um, and distribution would have several different channels and we're trying to sell ad space based on our content. That content could be some of our films from this business unit. It could be stuff we've acquired one business unit acquiring stuff, acquiring stuff from another, or it could be someone's third party content that we can tap into well. In addition, so this trying to value the content, so there's also trying to value these windows that's on TV. In Seattle, you've got one window, one long. TV, you can do several reruns. You can actually do experiments in Seattle. You can do A-B testing as well. And do it in the But the problem is, is that the time slot affects it a lot. And this is another thing we're doing Monte Carlo simulations in Racket 4, which hopefully in a couple of months I could come back and tell you how successful that is. Right now, it's just ongoing experimental code. Parks, as I said, is largely a travel agency, and this is this is a travel agency because all the major parks are in the U.S. But the data we're going from here is similar to kind of the data analytics you'd expect from anyone who runs a website. <coughs> you want to look at what your visitors are doing, what they're clicking on, what theme parks are interested in, what attractions in those theme parks are interested. And this is feeding in these projects over here. This is also a mix of bracket fast scripts, which is experimental code at the moment. New media and home entertainment are very, I don't know why they're such a business These ones are actively using racket, so they don't know it. I've got them in the telling people what's, what's going on with entities. And you want to, if you get a day job in a big corporation, this is what you should do. You should write something that solves your problem and fit it to yourself. And those five, three, three, four, two, the different five minutes of people to secure anything. Uh, home entertainment and new media are trying to, they have weird problems, actually. You guys might find this interesting. When we sell content to, to these third parties, whether it's, it's a DVD or if it's on Amazon or on Netflix, we don't actually control the price they sell it at. We don't even get to see it. We find out the price at the same time any other person would when they get on their website. Kind of a weird way to run a business, right? You don't even know how much consumers are paying for it. <coughs> so one of the racket projects we have for these two is, is one of these things that produces PDFs for people. It's this PDF workshop we talked about. And this is a racket script that can hack into iTunes, can hack into your X into Xbox Marketplace, into Sony's Marketplace. This is being important, I should say this. Um, that can look on the, get on Amazon and find out the price of it in different countries and different markets. It's a big data collection script. It's like a, a small little web spider. And this is something I haven't been very successful in because, I mean, it's a script. That's all it does, right? And who cares what script it is? This has been is used in, in in our company today, it's been very helpful for us for removing offices. Um, I'm about done because I've gone through all of my business units. Are there any more questions before I wrap up? Yes. Yes. <laughs> hey, you guys have a lot of code written in a combination of uh, Bracket and Python and Bash and JavaScript. Do you have a plan? Like, as you guys, uh, maybe the system starts to get bigger, kind of rework it all into one? Compared to like making racket all the time. Yes, yes, we do have a plan. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> so all of these, um, all of these, I'll go ahead and talk about it. I get fired. All of these business units are, uh, they're all operating independently. But what's actually going on, these ones are duplicating the same with what's going on here, what's going on here, what's going on here, what's going on here, going on here everywhere. And usually it's the same content that's going through different windows. But each time we're looking at it like it's something completely new. And going through the sales distribution marketing team, another team I mentioned when I talked about parks is the website teams, the people who are putting our content on, so, um, making our content social, putting it on Facebook and Twitter. Each of these teams, each of these business units, we produces those teams. So there's a lot of redundancy going on. And part of my job is to take all that in and construct one system that gives us one holistic view of our material as it goes through every different business. And yes, that is something I want to do at Racket. In fact, that's something I forgot to talk about here in our Monte Carlo simulation. I mentioned 
this is running on, this is an iPad app that we have the Monte Carlo simulation that's running on, on Amazon. This is a really complicated structure. Yeah. 
to wrap it onto the Python. Yeah. I don't know how to. Do it. What about the yeah. yeah. three times? Here. Oh. Cool. We have to get the Python bucket set up the right. Okay. Well, we need to we need to have a chat sometime today. So I have two performance-related questions. One is, um, so I'm, I'm shocked by how small the data are. I would imagine that if you were actually getting click streams from, you know, Netflix, what people are watching, at what point they're rewinding and everything, your, your data is going to go through the roof, right? Somebody has not been smart enough to write that into the contracts yet. They will be So right. at that yeah, time, probably, probably well, probably getting, you know, yeah, yeah. right. But um, I don't even know who who buys movie tickets. I don't know. Well, uh, sure. But uh, I do wonder about uh, you know your allergy to the JVM, which I share. I wonder at that point you'd have to overcome it because performance is going to become if you start getting that level of data. And then I have a completely unrelated uh, performance-related question, which is um, if you could get self loops, you know, so tail recursion for self calls, tail recursion, standard tail recursion optimization. You did get tail call optimization to refer to in any way. I don't know because I haven't tested that on the second question. On the first question, am I going to have to give up my KD analogy? If I, I like to think I would be open-minded enough to start writing in Java if I actually had to, but I really hope not. <laughs> well, no, the JVM yeah. is Java. Yeah, yeah. Well, so there's there's two really fancy languages running on the JVM right now. So closer, which part of the closer thing is trying to get it off the JVM. I get to your question in just a second. And Scala. I don't know a lot about Scala, but at least when it comes to testing out our Monte Carlo simulations. Um, Racket is several times faster. Python is several times faster than Clover. It's, it's, for performance-wise, I, I don't see any performance reasons why you would ever want to. Five years faster than Python, so yeah. I think I call it the question out there. Yeah. Yes, sir. How bad and numerous and frequent have the complaints been about that kind of 15 second delay? I'm thinking they're not actually going to tell me. So, and uh, I don't know if you've done any, any uh, usability work when you're designing an application for end users. The number one rule is that don't trust what the users tell you because they're not actually going to tell you what you want. You have to see them actually use it. And, uh, yeah, you guys have your, your internal software for managing your courses and for logging on to your systems. You know how those work, right? Um, random question, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but do you actually like using the software? Are they actually well written? Do they work very well? There's almost no software that I like using. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, do you have soft some of your internal software at Northeastern that's particularly painful to you? Sorry. So, internal software at North Eastern that's particularly painful to use. I'm not an NU person. Just say yes. <laughs> I know for a fact. Yes. If you have HR yes. software, if you have yes. work management software, it's, it's a pain in the butt to use. Are the developers ever going to fix it? No. No. Are you even telling the developers what your problems are? You're just, no, yes. you're just not using it. Well, yes. <laughs> it's not one person here. Most users aren't even going to tell you. They're just going to put your iPad down and walk away. Yeah, like really use Hold on. Networks involved. Just say it's the network involved. <laughs> Fifteen seconds is a bit hard. No, uh, you can you can pass the buck and blame things, but at the end of the day, you want to get something done, because, and you want to make, make sure if something's going wrong that you're around for it. Yes, um, sir. Is your contact information here? Because I mean, there are things I worked on in the past, and it'd be too long to talk about now, but I wanted to talk to you later about. Absolutely. I need to think about it. Yeah, later. I've got I've got plenty of business cards with me. Uh, my name's on the board if you want to Google me. Um, if this is proprietary or embarrassing, this is skip it, but um, is there any, I always like to know inside big companies, is there um, any mechanism or could there be to feed money back to open source projects? Most big companies have some mechanism to feed back into open source development if they're a software company. For us, uh, yeah, like, you know, I work with some yeah. computer and like I was, there was nobody to go to to encourage, you know, getting, like back then, just getting a license for purposes. The, uh, the, if you have someone using open source development who's on the management level of the company, they can carry it out. If you're below the management level. You have no hope. Well, I, the thing that triggered that question was you were saying, oh, you're going to have to buy Python or something. 
And, but yeah, I mean, that's like, you know, that's, and yeah, right. you know, for the amount of you know, 30 <laughs> seconds of advertising, you could, the whole budget of the entire time years that the project has been going would be perfect. This is not a new question. So, anyway. so we were bought by Comcast not too long ago, because Comcast wanted a media company. Where they bought us after the project by Disney. <laughs> I can talk about this because it's a public record. So, yeah, yeah. Security and Maintain Commission has to go through all of these things. Um, it was floated in the, uh, I probably shouldn't say anything, but anyway, it didn't um, And it was floated in our, our, one of our meetings about how other companies like Netflix <coughs> actually collects these large streams of data. Amazon, I mean, not Amazon, but Amex, American Express, actually has purchase information. That would be great. We need to acquire Amex. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're out of time. So, Matthias has. Um, I would like to thank our speaker first.